So good morning, everyone. What we're going to be talking about this morning is event sourcing. How many of you have heard of event sourcing? How many of you have implemented event sourcing? Whoa, that was a big difference in hands. We're going to go through some of the basics of event sourcing, but we're also going to go through some of the history of event sourcing and where it comes from. And then at the end, what I want to talk about is really where event sourcing is going to be going. What are some of the interesting problems that are still out there and people are, are not really fully into yet? As this is going to be a relatively short talk, um, probably we will not have a period of time afterwards for questions, but I will be around. Anyone feel free to come and grab me. Um, I won't bite you normally. So how many of you have built an audit log before? Of some type, maybe you put triggers on tables that wrote off to another table. Maybe you were writing directly records over saying what happened. Normally when we're going off building audit logs, the reason that we do this is because of some legal requirement. What's funny for me is that almost every team I've seen building an audit log was doing it for a legal requirement, but their, their logs wouldn't have been admissible in a court. The gold standard for being able to take your logs and bring them into a court is that you must be able to rebuild your entire current state off of your audit log. If you can't, it's not an audit log. Now, out of the people who raised their hands about making audit logs, how many of you can go through and actually rebuild the entire state of your system off of it? A lot less hands. And this is actually a big problem. I mean, you can imagine we go into a court and you're suing your bank because they, you think they miscalculated your account. And they bring in a transaction history that when it adds up, it adds up to neither the number they say you should have or the number you say you should have. What's going to happen at this point? This concept of an audit log is what brings a lot of people towards event sourcing. Event sourcing, by definition, builds its current state off of its audit log. And it's been used in a lot of different kinds of systems. Um, way back when, it was used in a lot of trading systems in particular. But over time, we started applying it to more and more different types of systems. Um, front-end business systems, back-office systems. And we started finding that there was a lot of value to it outside of systems that need to go really fast. Now, event sourcing is not new. I have managed to trace event sourcing all the way back to Mesopotamia and Sumeria. We came up with the concept of event sourcing at roughly the same time that we came up with agriculture and stopped living as hunter-gatherers. It is by no means new. And over time, well, we had some other things happen. And then we came to this, which was in 2007. Now, this isn't even really when people started talking about event sourcing. Event sourcing was actually popular before this. How many of you have gone and worked on an old mainframe system? A lot of old mainframe systems are actually event sourced. It started going out of popularity right around the time that we decided that we should build everything that we build using SQL databases. Prior to that, many of these kinds of systems were event sourced. And what's interesting is if you actually go look inside of your database, your database is probably event sourced internally. But I ended up doing this talk, and to be fair, this wasn't the first talk. This is actually the second one. I couldn't find the first one. The first one was actually in 2006 at QCon San Francisco. At the time, I was working for an algorithmic trading company, and I had never really talked at a, at a big conference or anything. And so I go to do this talk, which is basically trying to combine the work of Gregor Hoppe and uh, enterprise integration patterns uh, Martin Fowler with all of his patterns that he's been working on, and Eric Evans with domain-driven design. At the time, we were building an algorithmic trading system using domain-driven design, which was unheard of. Everyone that was doing domain-driven design back at this point, they were building out domain models for, 
front-end business apps with an ORM behind them. So it was a completely different take. And I go to do my talk, and in my front row, I have Martin Fowler, Gregor Hope, and Eric Evans. I had never met any of them before, but I had read their books. And I went through all my slides in about 20 minutes because I was very nervous. And at the end of the talk, Eric Evans comes up to me and he says, that was a really bad talk. <laughs> and if you've met Eric before, Eric is probably the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He never has anything negative to say. I came back the following year and did this talk, and Eric was in the audience again, and he comes to me afterwards and he says, that was a very good talk. But this stuff's been going on for a long time. Now, I've been using this slide for coming up on a decade. Because everything that you need to know about event sourcing, you can learn by talking to an accountant. Accounting is naturally event sourced. And literally, every question that you have, if you go talk to an accountant and you can convert it into accounting words, they can tell you how to solve your problem. Whether we're talking about versioning issues, whether we're talking about how to handle what happens when you make a mistake, all of these things, how to migrate an old system to a new system, they already know how to do all of it. Because they do it every day. They are in a naturally event-sourced model. What's interesting for me is that it's not only accountants. Every single mature industry that you look at is naturally event-sourced. Everyone. Finance, law, medical, insurance. When you go to the doctor, does he take a picture of you and put it in the file and throw away the old picture of you? Or does he constantly keep appending things to the end of your file? It's a naturally event sourced model. Legal. What happens if you sign a contract? And then a year later, you want to make a revision to the contract. Do you just go cross out a paragraph and you and somebody else initial it? Or do you add an addendum to the contract? And over a period of five years, we may end up with many addendums being put on the end of a contract. In order to figure out what the contract currently says, I take the original contract and then I apply the addendums on top of it. You'd be amazed how many of these systems are naturally event sourced. And there's a lot of reasons for why we may want to, why we may want to event source something. But there's one really, really important reason. It doesn't lose information. How many of you have an update or a delete statement in your system today? Okay, now keep your hands up if you went and had a conversation with the CEO about the cost-benefit analysis of that information. How much does it actually cost to store everything? What is that data going to be worth in the future? As a CTO, I had one rule for my organization. We won't lose data because I have no freaking clue how much it's worth. Can you predict what your company is going to ask you in two years about today? If you can't predict that, then you have no idea what the value of which data actually is, because it can change over time. Which is more expensive, to store 10 gigabytes of information or Coke? How much data can you fit in 10 gigabytes? It's an awful lot of data that you deleted that you could have just kept. But the thing is, I have no idea how to value this information. So we kept everything. Now keep in mind, we're going back to like 2005, 2006. There were points where we were storing 100 gigabytes a day. Can you imagine back then storing 100 gigabytes a day? We'd use big external NASs, and we'd store all this data on them. And you know what? It took a really long time to get it off. Why? Because when you have 100 gigabytes a day and a 100 megabit network, to get data off like took a weekend. 
but I have it. What's interesting is that you'll find that an event source system is the only system that will not lose data. And I've had people show me their SQL database for an accounting system. And then I went and looked, and there was one table called transactions with a transaction type. And depending on the type, they would join off to another table to get the data out. This is still an event source system. It's just they're using a different serialization format. But no matter what other system you pick, you're going to lose some amount of information. And it's this losing of information that can cause a huge amount of problems. Let's take a look at this quintessential piece of state. And I've used these four slides literally forever. So here we have a cart with N line items and some shipping information associated with it. What we're looking at here is the structure of this information. We're looking at the shape of the information. But this is not the only way of dealing with this. Another way of dealing with this is we could actually store some events. So here we have a cart created, three items adding, and shipping informati on it did. <laughs> but at any given point in time, I could replay these five events, and I could build you this, correct? I could take my five events, play them back in memory, and hand you back a piece of state. But what we store are the events. And there's a lot of benefits to storing the events as opposed to storing the state. How many of you have written a SQL migration script before? It's fun, right? <laughs> so one of the main benefits about having events in a log is events are much easier to version than state is. And I refuse to actually do a big bang release ever again, where I take the system down, upgrade it, and then bring it back up. I will always do side-by-side -side releases. Why? Because I'm scared. I am not scared that I'm going to take the system down, try to release it, and then everything's going to break. Why? Because I'm going to do a rollback. What really scares the crap out of me is I'm going to take it down, release it, bring it back up, and everything's going to work for a week. And then it breaks. So you guys are all writing SQL migration scripts. How many of you write SQL migration scripts from the new version back to the old version with data having been written to the new schema? Not nearly as many. So I've always joked on, on teams that I've worked with in the past, we came up with a good strategy for this. You had your choice. You could either wear the fireman hat or the cowboy hat. Um, the hats were basically a token to let people know that you were working in production. Without fail, whenever you're working on a big problem in production, somebody will come up to you and want to talk about the Christmas party. The hat is basically to tell them, look, I'm working in production right now. Unless you have something material to my issue, go away. But when we store events, events are much easier to work with running side-by-side -side versions. Why? Because we're actually taking our state and deriving it off of our events. Could I have two nodes running side-by-side -side looking at the same events and having different states that they perceive them as? This is one of the main benefits. They can look at it in completely different ways, even though they're sitting right next to each other. And I don't have to worry about versioning that state, because the state is transient. In an event source system, all of your state is transient. It may be persistent, but it's still transient. At any given point in time, I can take any of my state in my entire system and delete it because it's a first-level derivative off of my event log. This piece of state is a derivative off of these events. If I wanted to, I can go delete this piece of state because I can replay it off of the events a second time. Now, this may be an expensive operation, depending on what your system does, how many events you have, but you can do it. Now, it took me forever to find this particular slide that I've been using for all these years. There's a big problem inside of this slide. 
Accountants don't erase stuff in the middle of their journals. This does not happen. Okay, maybe at Enron. But if you took an accounting class in university, you might have had a teacher who said something along the lines of, accountants use pens, not pencils. You don't erase things in the middle of your journal. And as I mentioned, you can learn everything that you need to know about event sourcing by going off and talking with an accountant. And if you said to an accountant, what do you do if you make a mistake? They would say, well, I have one of two options. So let's say I fat finger and I send you 10,000 euros instead of 1,000 euros. I could do what's known as a partial reversal, and I could take 9,000 euros back from you and give it to me. But accountants will tell you they normally try to avoid doing this. Why? Imagine you're an auditor reading the books. Okay, so it's 10,000 and 9,000. You can do the calculation in your head really quick and go, ah, he intended to send 1,000 euros over. But what if they weren't perfect numbers? And what if there were five accounts involved? Well, you're going to end up with pen and paper trying to work out what, what I originally intended to do. So what they have a tendency of doing is they'll do what's known as a full reversal. In a full reversal, I'm going to take 10,000 back from you, saying that was a mistake, and then I'm going to give you 1,000. We can do the exact same thing in an event source system. In an event source system, we might say we have cart created, three items added, one item removed, and shipping informati on it. Is this the same as cart created, two items added, shipping information added? Well, this is always a fun question. Because you have some people in the room going, yes, and some going, no. And the answer is, it depends. What perspective do you have on the data? If I have this perspective of the data, those two will come out and be the same at the end, correct? What if I had a different perspective? What if I was, instead, counting how many times an item was removed? then they would have very different answers. There's also a fun game you can try playing in your own system. Can you come up with two sets of use cases that leave your database at the same state when they're done? So here we had two sets of use cases that would return us the same state when we looked at it from this perspective. If you can find that in your system, you just proved something to yourself. You're losing data. I'm going to come back to the question. How did you decide the value of that data that you're losing? By definition, if you have two sets of use cases that come to the same endpoint, you have lost something. And it's not losing of data. It becomes more valuable when we start looking at an example. Let's try this one. Let's imagine that we were a big online retailer. So we've got all of our carts, and the business guy comes to us and says, I think that people that remove items from their cart within five minutes before they check out are more likely to buy that item in the future. It makes sense, correct? Why do you remove an item five minutes before you check out? Well, you went and looked. And you saw all those books from Amazon were going to be like 400 euros. And you thought, my wife's going to kill me if I order that. So you take two or three, three things out of your cart, and then you check out the rest. So let's add the feature to this stateful model. So we're going to get a new one of these things coming off the bottom, which is going to be called removed line items. And when we remove a line item, we add it to the removed line items. And then we write a report that looks at removed line items and then does a nested subquery to see if you ended up going and buying this in the future. We release it to production. The user runs it, and they see nothing. We had lost that information coming all the way up until today when we started tracking it. Let's try it in this model. So what we're going to write is known as a projection. A projection is just a little piece of code 
that goes over an event stream and it produces a piece of state. In this case, what we're going to do is when we see the item removed, we're going to take the ID of the item and put it into our state, as well as the time that it was removed. We're then going to look for the shipping information added. When we get the shipping information added, we're going to basically look at the items that we found and see if any of them were within five minutes. If they were, we're going to mark that we're searching for them in the future, found equals false. If we found the guy that bought this item in the future, we mark it as being true. Now, what I have not told you about projections is that a projection must start on event number zero and come all the way forward in the log until it reaches now. This may take a weekend. You may have 100 million events that it needs to go over. You could have half a billion events that it needs to go over. But it's an asynchronous operation. So it goes all the way through, and then we write a report on the state that it put out. Business user goes and runs his report, and he sees all of the information, as if it's always been there. But we can actually do one better. I can tell the business user, if we had this report on July 17th, 2014, at 1402 in the afternoon, this is what that report would have said. All I have to do is to only play it forward in the log to that point in time. And I can do this with any report in our system. When you give me a new report today, I can tell you what it would have told you at any point in time during the entire lifetime of our system. That's pretty cool. And it's because everything has gone back to being deterministic and we're not losing information. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the basics of event sourcing. I want to get more into things off in the future and mistakes that people are making. But there's one side case for event sourcing that's very, very interesting. How many of you have had to build a secure system before? So if you're talking about secure systems, there's one particular attack vector that should make you run away. It's known as a super user attack. What you're being asked to defend against is a rogue developer or system administrator who is attacking your system. It is presumed they have super user privileges. How do you defend against root? It's actually very common to run into this in highly secure systems. Um, the one that I dealt with, we were doing gambling systems. And oddly, we were a high value target. We were the ones deciding who to pay. And we actually ended up with a guy hacking our system. He was a developer. He actually sat in the cubicle next to me. I'm going to go through the story in probably about two to three minutes. But the guy's name is Chris Harn. Um, and if you, if you put his name, you'll, you'll get to Wikipedia pages. And eventually, you'll actually get to a full hour-long HBO special about this. Um, it's, I believe the show is called Criminal Masterminds. I've always joked, what I never understood about Criminal Masterminds as a show is that they all get caught. <laughs> of course, the real Criminal Masterminds show wouldn't be very interesting either. It'd be like, and $6 million went missing from this bank in Toledo, and no one has any idea what happened. We just know the money's gone. So what we were doing was we, we had a, a given pool type. It was called a pick six. And because there were lots and lots of tickets in this, and for some other varying reasons, we would keep them at the remote tracks until the end of the fourth race. And then we would pick up the bets, and we'd ship them over at the end of the fourth race, but only the ones that were still winners. And it was Breeders' Cup Day. Breeders' Cup is the second largest racing day in America, only behind the Kentucky Derby. So what Chris was doing was he would go in, and he would put in a bet at a remote track. One, two, three, four, all, all. And then what he would do is he would edit the first four to be the first four winners. At the end of the fourth race, the scan would happen and go, this ticket is a possible winner. Let's ship it over. And 
and so it would get shipped over. And that, that's a possible winner, right? Oh wait, it has all all in the fifth and sixth legs. And he ended up getting caught. And he didn't get caught because he was stupid. He got caught because he was unlucky, which is what normally happens with super user attacks. So he does all of this, bets get shipped, everything's great until a 37 to one long shot wins in the fifth and like a 14 to one long shot wins in the sixth. He was the only winning ticket in the world. It was like a $3 million ticket. So normally what's going to end up happening in this case There's going to be 20, 30 winners. They're going to be worth 100, 150 grand each. Mutual manager is going to see this, sign off, ship it. But if you're the one winning ticket in the world, and it's a $3 million ticket, you can be damn sure they're going to look into that. And this ticket was odd. So of course, you know, let's get that remote track on the phone. Is there anything interesting going on over there? Oh, there's a developer on the maintenance line. That's interesting. Oh, the audit tape was ejected. That's interesting. Needless to say, we didn't end up having Chris in the office on Monday morning, but we had lots of new friends from the FBI. But we could have gotten around this problem. We could have gotten around this problem by using a worm drive. And this is one nice thing about event source systems. Since event source systems are append only, you can run them on top of a worm drive. A uh, worm drive is write once, read many. So you can only physically write to the disk once. Now, all of my current state is derived off of my log. My log is on write once media. It becomes much, much more difficult to attack me at this point. And this is not a primary use case of event sourcing, but it's a really nice one if you happen to run into the problem. By the way, if you're dealing with a, a highly secure system with auditors, and you tell them that your current state is all derived off your audit log and your audit log is on a worm drive, they'll like you a lot. It's basically the gold standard for building these kinds of systems. But there's some other really cool things that I can do. How many of you have had a bug in your code before? Actually, a friend of mine, uh, Hadi, uh, Hadi Hariri, when I went and looked, he had a picture the other day. Apparently, he had an ant inside of his screen of his laptop. And it's like, I just need to make a joke about a bug. But the worst kinds of bugs are the ones that are transient. So the system gets into some state where it's not behaving correctly, and then the system gets out of that state and starts behaving again. Why? Because they're very difficult to track down. One of the nice things about an event source system is just like with projections that we can go back to any point in time, my domain model is just another projection. I can bring it back to any point in time by only replaying the events up to that point in time. So I like to store my commands as a log. And then I can see that this command was coming in at this point in time and it was getting a weird behavior. It was getting errors. And I can basically bring it down to a little app that I run that instead of bringing it up to the current version, we'll bring it up to the version it was at the time that that command was being run. And then I can step through the debugger and see what actually happened. My entire model can be brought back to any point in time of the history of the system as well. Now, conceptually, we always think about our event log from the beginning to the end. But sometimes you may run into a problem. What happens if I've got a million events? Replaying a million events is going to be slow. So what we can also do is we can actually go backwards. So now we start with event number six, we go to number five, and then we get what's known as a snapshot. This snapshot applies at event number four, and basically we can go forward from there. Basically, it's a memoization. Now, what's interesting for me is that over time, event sourcing has been picked up by a lot of object-oriented developers. What's funny about it for me is that event sourcing isn't object-oriented at all. 
event sourcing is a functional model. How many of you have tried functional programming before? Oh, a good number. So let, let me explain event sourcing in a different way for you. Current state is a left fold over previous behaviors. Snapshots are a memoization of the fold. OK, that's it. It's the entirety of event sourcing. If you actually go into a functional language, you'll have no need for a framework whatsoever. You need such really deep concepts as left fold and pattern match and functions. And that builds up your entire framework for you. Normally, what ends up happening as well is we end up with an architecture that looks like this. So basically, we're storing off all of our events. But our events aren't really useful for querying purposes. I mean, imagine, I want to get a list of customers with the first name of Greg. So I'm going to replay over all of my events in a MapReduce to get back all the first names with Greg. Which is going to be faster, that or a bee tree? So chances are I don't want to be doing all my queries off of that. Instead, I prefer to have other models that I can query off of. As an example, we might have a graph database. We might have an OLAP database. We might even have multiple of them. It's OK. There's things outside of SQL. Now, how many of you have heard of these before? You know you're not cool if you're not using these. Well, with the exception of one of them. But I'm, I'm going to tell you a little secret. There is no best storage. Every database on the planet sucks. Even event store. Event store sucks, too. In fact, when I see these, what I am reminded of is these. Ah. How many of you remember object databases? If about 12 years ago I were to go to QCon London, there'd be lots of talks about these. These were going to take over the world. No one will ever use SQL ever again. In fact, using an object database, it has no impedance mismatch with your domain model. It's so freaking cool. About 10 times faster than using SQL. And you don't have to write all that crap mapping stuff. How many of you use an object database today? Should have had a sound effect for crickets. <laughs> so what happened? I thought they were going to take over the world, kind of like these are going to take over the world. What happened with object databases? Well, everything that they were actually saying was true. They were 10 times faster. They had no impedance mismatch. It was actually really cool. And then you put your system out in production, and then some cheesy business guy comes up to you and goes, hey, can I get a report of all of our sales rolled up by postal code in town? And you go, that means I need to load up like 200,000 objects in the memory and iterate over them. You seem to remember there was this thing called like group by. Object databases suck. No, they don't. Object databases suck at OLAP. And they suck really, really hard at OLAP. They're terrible for it. In transaction processing scenarios, they're, they're, they're reasonably good. But for OLAP, they're terrible. This is part of why SQL is, is going to be popular forever. SQL is not amazing at anything. But it's not utter rubbish at anything either. You can always get your, your thing to work. Whereas when we start talking about other forms of databases, they tend to be very, very good at one thing, but then really, really bad at some other things. And what you'll start learning is that in most systems like this, you don't want to have a single model. You want to have multiple read models that you can query off of. Why? Because using a single model will introduce massive amounts of accidental complexity to your problems. How many have heard of this startup? <laughs> so I don't know how many people have actually read into the history of them. And 
So Twitter at its core is a topic-based pub sub, correct? So if I were going to implement this, you know what I would do? I would ignore decades of research in the financial industry on topic-based pub subs, and I would go take Ruby on Rails and MySQL as my tool chain. <laughs> they got to the point they had hundreds and hundreds of MySQL nodes trying to keep up with their workload. And the entire thing was nothing but accidental complexity. They replaced it with less than 10 nodes later by bringing in people that actually had a background building out topic-based pub subs. The entire problem that they had, if you guys remember the fail whale, it was all accidental complexity, nothing more. And you'd be amazed how many problems you can get into where everything around you is accidental complexity. Your 16-month project could have been done in a day with a different decision. Everything around you is accidental complexity. The worst part about this is you normally can't see it and recognize it when you're inside of it because it feels like real complexity to you. Let's try another example with SQL. So here we have an ID, a parent ID, and some data. How many of you have built this before? So now we, we go and we release this to production. And they come back and go, well, this report's been running for 14 minutes. And of course you go, well, it works on my machine. We should have used Docker so we could ship my machine. <laughs> but what's the difference between your machine and production? Number of rows in the table. You are running with like 100, they've got 100,000. And you built a recursive query. So you guys are all good developers. Maybe you came up with this idea. So now you have ID, parent ID 0, parent ID 1, parent ID 2, up to the depth that you want to allow in the tree. Because now I can do a query where I can say where ID equals or parent ID 1 equals or parent ID 2 equals or parent ID 3 equals, and then I can recurse in memory. This is accidental complexity. I worked with a company in America. They had tables that looked like this. And they had two, like, half-million-dollar servers trying to run queries across these. So they had one table, which was people, and another table, which was relationships. What are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to figure out if I can get a link to him through other people that I know based on certain relationship types. Half million dollar servers running these queries, they have half a terabyte of memory in them. Arrays of SSDs. They've been working on this project for over a year trying to get good performance out of this. I don't even want to know what their SQL server licenses cost for this problem. And so I'm getting in and looking at it, I'm like, hmm, you know, this looks familiar. Let's install Neo4j, a graph database, because this is a graph. My laptop outperformed their $500,000 servers. <laughs> we put it into production the next day, and basically we pissed off for the rest of the week because we were supposed to spend the whole week working on this problem. But this is common. And when we talk about this kind of levels of accidental complexity, it's not like, I'm going to reduce your budget by 5%. It's like 10 developers working for a year on something versus half a day. The wrong kinds of models can cause a ridiculous amount of accidental complexity. And the really awful thing is you don't see the accidental complexity until somebody can come and point it out. I have watched teams get in the weeds trying to use JSON inside of Postgres. And then you show them that there's other databases that actually support Postgres uh, uh, JSON too. And here's how they work. And they go, oh, well, that's so much easier or trying to use full text indexing inside of their database. 
as opposed to using something like Lucene or Solar. Huge amounts of accidental complexity come off of this. And remember that in these kinds of systems, we can have multiple models. But this is one place where a lot of people get screwed up in event source systems. And they like to do this. You know it wouldn't be a PowerPoint presentation if there wasn't a big square that said bus on it someplace. <laughs> so here what they're doing is they're still using Hibernate and writing back to, let's say, a third normal form database. And then they're going to publish an event afterwards. And this causes a huge number of problems. The first problem has to do between this publish and the third normal form database. Because you're going to need to do this atomically somehow. So a lot of people will go, we'll bring in distributed transactions. And now you have two problems. But there's other issues that come up inside of this. To be fair, you can get around the distributed transaction problem by making your database into a queue. And this is what a lot of people do. They'll actually create a table named Q and insert their events in, as part of the transaction into that table and read them out asynchronously to publish them onto the bus. But there's a, a more sinister problem in all of this. What happens when I put in a new model? How do I get all the old events to build out my model? Well, I'm going to need like a control channel or something there, correct? To like tell something on the other side to publish them all to my queue. But when they publish them all to my queue, I don't want it to publish to all the queues, just my queue. And guess what we just did? We just broke both the rules of PubSub. So the two major rules of PubSub is, one, producers should not know who consumers are. Two, Consumers should not know who producers are. So when I, have to, when I have to send over a message to the other side going, hey, can you send me your history? That means I know who my producer is. And on the back end, in order for my producer to send them to just me, he needs to know I am his consumer. And just think about the IT ticketing system with this. It'll be fun. But we run into a lot of problems here when we try to replay models. Also, what happens with the old data coming over and now I'm publishing new events? Do we put them in with the old events? Do I, do I hold them all and give them at the end once we're caught up again? Of course, if we're using an event source system, our event log, we, we saw earlier, it's basically conceptualized as just an appending file. If you wanted to be a consumer to me, all you would need to remember is, what's the last event that you processed? We could do this with a simple one method interface. Give me the next n after x. And then you remember the last event that you processed. So he says to me, give me the next five after event number zero. And I go, here's event one, event two, event three, event four, event five. He processes locally, and when he's done, he puts in his checkpoint. I have processed event number five. Now, if he goes down and comes back up, he reads from his checkpoint, what's the last thing I've processed? Event number five. So he says, give me the next five after event number five. So I give it to him. By the way, how many of you could do that concurrently? All of you, right? We wouldn't need to go set up queues in RabbitMQ or, or deal with crazy things with a bus. All of you would be able to have your own subscriptions. Now, what happens if he wants to replay? Well, he deletes his local data, and then he goes, I have no checkpoint anymore. Give me the next five after I've never seen an event before. Do I need to know that he's doing a replay? Do we have any coordination logic here? If I had all of you of subscribers, any of you can replay and do anything that you want on your own. We don't have to coordinate. No IT tickets. 
And we don't need this concept of a control channel. By the way, this is also how blogs work. A really common way of interchanging between us would be an RSS feed or an Atom feed with events in it. The Atom protocol works in the exact same way. Can you imagine if blogs worked over RabbitMQ? So like, you want to come read my blog. So there's a link there, and you say, oh, I'd like to, get your, I'd like to subscribe. So what happens is that sends me an email that you'd like to subscribe to my blog. So I go create you a queue in RabbitMQ, and I respond back, here's a URI to your queue. And everything's good. The posts start coming. But then you get a new laptop. And you say, oh, I, need, I want to do a replay. I want to get your old blog post locally. So just like what we were doing here, you're going to have to send me an email to tell me to put all my old blog posts into your queue so you can get them out. How many of you would use a blogging system like this? There are times when we may prefer a consumer-driven subscription. And what we can end up with is a really simple model, where we're just following events using this really simple, give me the next n after x. And when we bring up a new model, it's absolutely trivial. It just starts out without having a checkpoint. You can replay at any point that you want. There's another benefit that we get out of this architecture. I can have multiple of the same model. I can have 15 instances of my OLAP model. And we can put a load balancer in front of them. Load balance the queries between the 15 different databases. It's a very common pattern. Now, in terms of read models, my personal favorite read model is going to be something like a star schema OLAP model. Why? Because I don't like writing reports. I work mostly with people in things like finance and gambling. And you know, these people, they tend to be really good with Excel. So I give them a star schema database, and I let them connect to it with Excel. And they actually prefer this to me writing them reports. Now, when you start getting a lot of these people, you might want to have multiple instances of this. There's all kinds of other cool read models we can have. One question I like to ask people is, what information on this screen changes depending which user it is? Nothing. Why well, no great read model, then? HTML on disk. I'm pretty sure we know how to scale static HTML these days. But the key here is we must be able to replay this information. Now, briefly, I want to talk more about the future of where we're going. Because there's a lot of areas that are very, very interesting, but a lot of people haven't gone into them yet. The first one is functional programming. Too many people are doing event sourcing in object-oriented languages. Try the functional way of doing it. It's so much cleaner. And to be fair, you'll actually understand event sourcing a lot better as well. The move from the way a lot of people are dealing with data to event sourcing is conceptually very much the same move from object orientation to functional, where in event sourcing, everything is immutable and append only. A lot of the thinking is functional in its nature. The next big thing, multiple timelines. And you've all probably dealt with an end temporal system before. How many of you have a bank account? Have you ever noticed that you have two balances? One is called a ledger balance, and the other is called an available balance. What they're representing is that when I put a transaction in, I may not necessarily be putting a transaction in that is effective right now. And the two different balances represent two different ways of looking at the same timelines. One is on when it came in. The other is on when it is effective. And there's a lot of work going on with this right now and trying to get into systems that effectively deal with end temporal data. 
This is a huge problem for a lot of financial companies, trying to maintain n versions of timelines. And in event source systems, this is actually relatively easy to do. And I think we're going to see more and more and more people focusing on this problem because it exists in a lot of industries, and it's being solved poorly in many of them. The other place I think we're going to start seeing a lot more event sourcing is in clients. How many of you have tried to build an occasionally connected client before? A client that works when you unplug the network cable and start synchronizing things. In an append-only model, it's far simpler to deal with synchronization than it is inside of, let's say, a model where you're just mutating things. In fact, many of these kinds of mobile apps, or now people are even doing it with browser-based apps, many of them become trivial. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot more people doing client-side event sourcing. Now, just to summarize, in the future, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more around multiple timelines. Out of everything that I've said today, probably one of the most important is that a single data model is almost never going to be appropriate for your system. Almost never. You're going to end up with two or three. You may end up with, let's say, something like a MongoDB, but then you also have a problem which is a graph. So you end up with a graph database for that problem. Now, before you go back and say, Greg told us we should have a different data model for every report. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Understand that for every one that you bring in, there's also an operational cost. If you bring MongoDB into your organization, somebody needs to know what the hell it is. How do I monitor it? What should I look for in logs? How do I do a backup? What do I do when it randomly loses my data? Somebody needs to know all of this stuff. And we need to understand that there's a trade-off, operational cost versus development cost, and how simple our system is going to be. It's not that you should just willy-nilly bring in all these different models. But you should consider it. Understand that it's an option. If you have events that have been stored, it's relatively easy to bring in new models. Oops, it's delayed. There we go. Remember as well that picking the wrong model can cause you a massive amount of accidental complexity. And again, this is, this is not a 5% savings we're talking about. Oftentimes, this is like a 99% savings off of project costs. And if you don't believe me, I want you to go try to hire a Java developer to build you a blog. <laughs> and you're going to go to hire them, and they're going to be like, blog, OK, we can do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in um, we're gonna bring Spring and Hibernate. And you're going to be sitting there going, WordPress. It's the same type of thing. Oftentimes, we're talking 99% cost reductions by choosing the right models. And the last thing is that event sourcing is functional. It's not object-oriented. Trying to implement event sourcing in, in object-oriented languages tends to obscure what's really actually happening. Whereas if you try it in a functional language, it becomes very, very clear what is happening. And it's explicit. And there's no magic going on, like using reflections. or It's very, very explicit what actually happens. And with that, I will thank you guys for coming out. Um, I hope everyone has a good rest of the conference. If people have questions, I will be around during the rest of the conference. And feel free to come up and ask me questions. And again, thanks.